Welcome to Money in the Air, the music podcast about neighboring rights, the royalties you earn from the public performance of your recordings and the business of music in general. Brought to you by IFR, the International Association for Artists and Rights Holders. I'm Andrew, co-founder and chief royalty officer of Royalty. Hi, I'm Gina Deacon. I work for Absolute Rights Management and I work with record labels and artists to ensure we claim the royalty income due to them. I'm Stacey Haber and I'm from Inside Baseball Music Publishing. Hi, welcome back to Money in the Air, the Neighboring Rights Podcast brought to you by IFR, the International Association for Artists and Rights Holders. And joining Andrew, Gina, and I today is Fred Walter. Hello, Fred. How are you? Oh, hello there, Stacey. I'm very well, thank you. Absolute pleasure. We've been working together and talking about managing artists, being a music lawyer, and how we help them. I've been talking to you about neighboring rights, and I wondered if you had any questions for the panel. Neighboring rights, as ratified in the UK legal system, it's my understanding that it's not necessarily something that's mentioned in the statute law. So I'm wondering if it's appropriate to ask uh, how practitioners such as yourselves approach dealing with an area of law that has sort of been developed by EU influences and case law. The statute that governs us for neighboring rights in the UK is the Rome Treaty, and it was signed in 1961. We were one of many hundreds of countries that signed it and then ratified it here. It's sometimes called equitable remuneration. Sometimes it's called related rights. Mostly we refer to it as neighboring rights. And we've always, since 61, recognized the public performance royalty in the recording and PPL, the Phonographic Performance Limited, was set up to collect and administer that royalty for us. So that's how we deal with it. It hasn't changed much since. There are some some countries within the EU where they have applied it to streaming and they were meant to ratify it on a country by country basis and only Hungary and Spain have, but the others will follow suit even though they're late. The UK has not but it will. How important in your experience has it been so far to teach young musicians and young artists about the value of these performers' rights and how they might uphold them? It's really important because it's just not covered enough. It's kind of like the unknown revenue stream. So many artists miss out on it because they just aren't aware of it and they're like, they, they kick themselves off because, you know, why did I not know about it? How did I not know about it? And they don't. And it's kind of one of those things that can either be word of mouth. You know, your peers will check with you and see if you're claiming it. For new artists, legacy artists, kind of, you know, if they have missed the boat, then really it's it tends to be representatives that will connect with them and just say to them, you know, do you realise you're missing out on this income? And by then... They've missed the bulk of it because you can only go back and claim so far. And that's why it's really important to get on at the beginning. You know, when you start recording, making contributions on recorded music, join then. It's free. You know, there is nothing to pay. So why not join? Do you have any kind of ballpark about how much money might be sitting out there for a good session player? who is on, say, 10 recordings a year? I mean, it absolutely depends on how many other contributors on a recording, how often they get played, what time of day they get played, what radios, all that. There's so many different factors. And we're talking just about PPL. We, we could be talking about, obviously, not America, if they're a session player, but we're talking about the other big societies as well, Germany, Netherlands, France. You know, it really could impact on them. So it's just a case of if you've not claimed on anything, join PPL, ask for a worldwide mandate and get that going and get that in place. And if your repertoire is just too much to manage, check out a representative and they'll do it for you. I'm not saying that this is how much money is available for all the artists, but I think a good idea that session musicians, feature artists, producers even should do is to look at the revenues of the collection societies that are collecting in the specific territories to kind of get some type of a basis as to what is the overall pool every single year that is collected to be distributed across all the members. But it should give somebody a ballpark figure of the overall amounts that are collected by these societies. 
moral rights in copyright, how that might apply to the performer's rights and the application of them. Equity remuneration within Rome Convention countries is very similar to moral rights in especially France, but the EU in general, in that they are non-waivable. You cannot waive them. And even if you try to, the waiver is null and void ab initio. So it never takes. And it's because it's so entrenched in the rights that, that you cannot give them up. In fact, if you don't mention neighboring rights specifically in your will, your heirs lose them. You must mention them separately to all other royalties and rev rights and revenue streams. Great question. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for listening. Join Gina, Andrew and I next week for more Money in the Air. And remember, if you're not a member of IFR yet, go to www.iafar.co.uk. We'd love to have you. Bye.